Good to see you and have you with us today as well. We are going through study of the minor prophets, brief study of the minor prophets during the summer. And today we land at the book of Joel. And the minor prophets are dealing with issues in Israel and Judah. And God's dealing with them, God's judgment on them, God's holding them to accountability. And we're going to look at that today in Joel. And Joel's pretty ominous in what he's speaking to us about. So we'll get there in a moment. But before we do, I want us to just spend some time in prayer together. And, you know, wonderful leadership this morning in worship of God's victory and God given, you know, life is hard, but God gives us victory over sin and God gives us victory over issues if we'll allow him to give us that victory. And this final song, Even If, because I know a lot of us have even if moments and you may even be in an even if moment. So I want to take a few moments. I want us to pray together. I want you to go to the Father on your own first. I want you to just pray. I want you to talk to God about what's going on with you right now. And then I'll close it up, and then we'll get into God's Word together in the book of Joel. So let's bow our heads and just take a moment. We've been praising God. We've been lifting Him up. Continue to do that. But what's burdening your heart what's before you right now just cry out to God with it I'll lift up right now a young man Aiden who's in the ICU with some health issues, and hopefully he'll be able to, to get out and be okay later today, but I pray for him. I pray for his family as they walk with him. I pray for the family of the fishermen who went missing off the coast yesterday. He's a local to Jack's. And I can't imagine the fear and agony in their hearts right now. The families of those lost in the, the condominium collapse in Surfside and the pain that they must be enduring, the incredible even-if moment. And Father, we could just stay here and list name after name and issue after issue that's in the news, that's in our personal lives. Father, we praise you that you enable us to encounter you with, in your grace and in your love. And in the pain and the heartache of our lives. And Lord, may we be honest before you. Where the pain and the hurt is real. May we also evaluate our lives and try to understand what's put us in that position. But may we trust you and your grace and your mercy to minister to us.
Now, Father, as we go to the prophecy of Joel today. Joel speaks to a topic that, Father, can be very difficult. Because in speaking to the nation of Judah, he's speaking to their, your coming judgment on them because of their actions in separating from you. And he's speaking to the reality of, of end time actions of all mankind. And Lord, this topic can be tough sometimes. It can be challenging. Speak to us today. And may your truth minister to us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. You know, end times types of issues are a big deal. People love them. The church loves them. You have a, you know, we just had a group that had a study of Revelation. They had a great group on Monday nights. Revelation, anytime you break out an end times type of study, it seems like we as a church want to go to it. And people even say, when are you going to talk about this? When are you going to talk about that? But it's not only us. You know, it's the culture. Look at movies. You know, when you look at movies, you look at um, Armageddon, World War Z, the Independence Day genres, and I could sit here forever and think about movies just to go on and on about end times and all this mess. You take books, War of the, War, uh, War of the Worlds, too many W's for me, is, uh, you know, when H.E. Wells did that and it was broadcast back in the 30s, it still has been made into a movie. People love in Hollywood to talk about it, and, and you have that book. And then you have what we call doomsday cults. Some of you may remember Heaven's Gate. Uh, that is not a fake picture. That's a real picture. And they were a cult that said everybody's going to die. God's coming. They all killed themselves. Um, and that happens often, unfortunately, that doomsday cult group of people. Be it culture, be the church, there's an infatuation with end times. But there's a reason there's an infatuation, and it's just, not just because we're sorted and we want to see things happen. There's infatuation because it's real, because Scripture speaks to it. Scripture says it's there. And so it's there because our human condition wants to know and wants to understand. And that takes us to Joel today. Joel was a prophet and um, speaking to the nation of Judah. The nation of Israel at this time had been split into two due to rebellion and civil war, for lack of a better word. And the northern tribes, the ten, were up in the northern part of modern-day Israel. The two lower tribes, Judah and Benjamin, in the south, Joel is speaking to them. He's warning them of their need to humbly turn to God and, and repentance in their hearts. And he, and he tells them, and he tells us, the day of the Lord is both a day of terror and a day of hope. I want you to hear that this morning. We usually don't put terror and hope together. In the economy of God, in the same coin that God uses, those are very real. And we want to understand how that works and what God is saying and what His truth communicates to us today. And it communicates both two understandings and two applications. So let's just jump in. Joel is three chapters. We will not look at every verse. I'll pull some out. We'll, we're going to basically look at the first two chapters and then look at the end of the second and the third and look at it in two ways. And the first thing that you and I need to understand is the day of the Lord occurs in real time. I want you to hear that. The day of the Lord occurs in real time. What does that mean? Now. The day of the Lord is part of my history and your history every day. We may not realize it. We may not look at it in that way. But God very much looks at it and moves. And that's what he's doing. He is moving his people to be called into account for their actions. He's warning those of, of his day and our day that are rebellious. And he's warning them to turn back. He's also assuring them salvation is near. But notice what, what Joel does. Joel jumps right in. And Judah had a history, Israel had a history, though they were called of God, because you may not know much about their history and what they did, is almost from the very beginning of being delivered from Egypt and sent into the promised land and God marching them into Canaan, almost from the beginning they became rebellious. Almost from the beginning they looked out for themselves. Almost from the beginning they started idol worship. Almost from the beginning they began pushing back and pushing back. It didn't matter that God was working around them daily with miracles and truths and great things. Their human nature, their sin nature, like mine, kept pushing back 
and pushing back. And so they landed at this moment because of that. And so Joel jumps right in. And notice in verses 4 through 7, and I think they'll be on the screen. They're not on the screen, but others will be on the screen. Let me read these to you. What the knowing locust, gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten. And what the creeping locust has left, the stripping locust has eaten. I didn't know there were those many kinds of locusts or loci, what do you call them? But they were, they were getting after, okay? Lost my place. Chapter 5, verse 5. Awake, drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you wine drinkers, on account of the sweet wine that is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of a lion, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has made my my vine a waste, and my fig tree splinters. It has stripped them bare and cast them away. Their branches have become white. The sins of Judah were bringing anguish to Judah. And God often used, be it locusts, be it other things, if you look back to Egypt with the plagues, God used nature to often bring destruction. And that's what he did here. If we were to look down in verses 8 through 13, you see more. He talks about the priests and the ministers mourning, their, how God was rejecting their sacrifices. And so many things are going on. And so God used the locusts to get their attention. That that you need to survive, you don't have because of your sin, because of walking away from what God has, from what you've done. And why would God do this? They had walked away from serving him. They had walked away from worshiping him. So he's trying to get their attention. He's trying to say, hey, come on, man, come back. Know what's going on here. Be aware. Look at verses 14 and 15. Consecrate a fast. Proclaim a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. He's saying, come together, have a serious service of worship, pouring yourself out to God. Woe for the day. And then there's that phrase, for the day of the Lord is near and it will come as destruction from the Almighty. He's saying, y'all need to be aware that God is bringing judgment against you. And when you read the Old Testament, All the prophets are about judgment. When you get to 1 Kings, it all turns into Israel pushing back and walking away from God. So much of the Old Testament is to this reality that the nation of God walked away from God. And so he's saying, come back to me. Now notice chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 11, what he says. Blow a trumpet in Zion. That's another word for Jerusalem. And sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord. You're you're going to see this consistently in Joel's writing. Indeed, it is near. The Lord utters his voice before his army, and his camp is indeed very great. For mighty is the one who carries out his word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Great question. Who can endure it? And we see that here. Who can endure the day of the Lord? Is there a way back? Is there a way of restoration? Joel asked, and we ask. God is gracious. Yes, there is. Look what he says in verses 12 and 14, 12 through 14. Yet even now, so all this stuff's going on, okay? This this people of God has stepped away from him. And God has declared very much, You know, sometimes we ask ourselves, okay, what's the big deal? If I just kind of live a little differently than than God may want me to. Now, by the way, God never calls me to perfection. Never calls me to that. He really doesn't call me to sinlessness because I can't. He just calls me to confess and repent and deal with it. But let's remember the nature of God. God is holy. And a holy God cannot look on ravenous sin over and over again. But yet, look what he says. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart and with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Tear your heart and not merely your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is what? Gracious and compassionate. He is slow to anger. He is abounding in mercy and relenting of catastrophe. Who knows? 
Because God's gracious and compassionate. He might turn and relent and leave blessing behind him, resulting in a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God, worship that God would accept. He said, return. Go back to God and who he is and what he's about. Go back to his direction. Rend. We don't use that in our language much, but think of... um, in Israeli worship and Jewish worship and other forms, a lot of times worship is actually rending our clothes. We're in such agony that we tear and rend. He's saying, rend your hearts. Recognize what's going on here. And God may do what? God may relent. God may change his mind. He may cease. He may say, I see your actions and I respond to that. And we see case after case where God brought forgiveness and restoration. The day of the Lord is real time. It's in my history. It's now. But God offers a way out and a way back. Um, got kind of dicey Wednesday afternoon here, didn't it? If, you, if you're a Phillips Highway, Bay Meadows type person, Beth was coming to meet with me, and she's like, uh, it's pretty crazy because she lives over in Lakewood. And all through that area, we had issues, and you see the, the picture. That actually, if you've ever done work with cannons, that they do tailor, uh, trailer hitches and stuff. I've been in that building. Uh, it got beat up bad, other thing. And, but here's the thing. Just like many disasters, we hear about them. We watch them from afar, but we never think they're coming our way, right? You know, Elsa's not nothing. She's just a pretty princess that likes ice. Um, you know, this and that and all these other things. We're not going to get hurt. And then all of a sudden, it steps up into our business. And it's real. And it's scary. We watch God bring judgment in people's lives. We see tough things happen because of decisions that are made. Surely that's not going to happen to me. God doesn't work that way with me. Until he does. How do we process this? How do we look at this truth today? And say, God, what, what are you speaking to me? What are you saying to me? Last week, we were in the book of Obadiah. Great little book. 21 verses, I think. There was a central theme in Obadiah to the children of Israel and to us. Be accountable. You are accountable to God. You name God as your God you name him as your Lord, you are accountable to live like him to the best of your ability. You're, you're accountable to honor him. And that was the theme last week. And that theme relates to me as a follower of Jesus. I am accountable to the Jesus who saved me. And I am accountable to live in a way that honors him and glorifies him. And just as God spoke against Israel and their lack of accountability, God speaks to me as well, and I need to be mindful of that. God's not going to be treat me any differently. And so God calls us to that. God calls me to be accountable. God calls me to repent. God calls me to allow him to, to push away from those things that may be, bring harm, costly and painful. I want to talk honestly about this for a moment. Life is hard. Life is difficult. Life is difficult because of our genetics and our DNA. Life is difficult because we live in a fallen world. Life is difficult because sometimes people push back and push into us and we had nothing to do with it. Life is hard because sometimes our bodies are frail and they break and it hurts. That's real. A lot of times those are even if moments that we need to let God speak into us. Here's something that I need to understand for my life. And you need to understand for you. Some of my pain is my fault because it's unrepented sin. Some of my problems and some of my issues is because I refuse to repent of the sin that put me in that situation. And now I'm tasting of it. We don't like talking about that. We love the compassionate and graciousness of God. We don't like the consequences and punishment of sin. You know, let me just hit some real issues that may or may not hit where you are or where I am, but but they, they, they hit where we are. 
Maybe I so mishandle and are so wrongly motivated with my finances that I'm tasting a financial loss and bankruptcy, and God is doing that to try to get me back to him and live the way he would want me to be responsible in that area. Maybe there are issues in my, in my relationships, and I'm broken in them because I am selfish, because I am critical, because I am negative, because I am mean, and I have created an environment where people do not want to be around me. That is on me to repent of. In friendships, maybe we've had issues and you've offered me forgiveness and I've said, I'm not forgiving you and that creates a separation. That's on me. You see how real these things are? This is day in, day out realities. Maybe I have physical issues, I have emotional issues and I have mental issues because you know what? Things have happened in my life. I have, I have issues that, that, that I struggle with. And hey, if, I have, if you have emotional or mental battles, that happens. And that's why we, we seek treatment and we seek God to work. But sometimes I'm there because of my use of substance. I'm there because of, of, of roads that I shouldn't go on, but I've decided to go down those roads. And now I'm tasting of the consequence of that sin. Folks, we've got to understand if we're serious about our faith and we want the world to look at us as serious about our faith, then we need to deal with our sin before we call out their sin. And boy, I love calling out sin, not my own. It's their fault. If they would just, they're not my responsibility other than to share the love of Christ and show it. It's my responsibility to act like Jesus and deal with sin if it's eating me up. That's hard stuff. But I want to challenge me and I want to challenge you today. What's going on in your life? Is some of the pain and the consequences because of unrepentant sin? And you need to spend time with God getting it right. And God is calling you to this. Maybe this is your day of the Lord in real time. And God is saying, I love you. I want you to return to me. I want to reestablish that relationship with you. I want to walk with you. But I can't do it until you acknowledge it and you deal with it. Don't let your pride get in the way. Don't let your selfishness get in the way. Don't let anything get in the way. Well, how do I know that God will respond? 1 John 1, 9, beautiful promise. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous so that he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If I confess, God, I'm laying before you a life that has done damage to me and others. I'm, I'm, I'm laying before you the reality of the source of my pain. And I repent of that and I confess that. Please heal me. The promise of God is what? He forgives and he heals. Okay. Forgiveness means as far as the east is from the west, my sins are forgiven. Okay. Cleanse us from all unrighteous means I'm clean in Christ and I can move forward. Okay. That means I may not have to deal with some consequences and stuff, but you know what? Now I can deal with that with the love and the truth of Christ and probably be much more redemptive toward other people. Folks, this is a big issue. As a follower of Jesus Christ, am I willing to really get down dirty and deal with this issue? Real time. The day of the Lord is in real time. Let's talk about something that often is much more enjoyable to talk about because we hope it won't involve us, but the day of the Lord is in future time as well. See, what Joel says in in, in chapters 1 and 2, he's very just... Deal with your sin. God's going to come one day, though, he says at the end of 2 and into chapter 3, where he deals with all sin, where he resets the world, if you will. And, and we see that here, that, that what's going to happen, God's going to intervene in the affairs of man to bring judgment and to, to, to bring work into his life. Look at chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. Notice what he says. It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all of mankind. 
And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams. Your young men will see visions. And even on the male and female servants, <clears throat> excuse me, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will come about that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, just as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom he calls. So God says, approach me and I'll draw you to me. But he says that day is coming. That day is coming when I'll draw all men to accountability. Now, great question is, well, when's that going to happen? The right answer, I don't have a clue. None of us do. But how do we understand it in context a little bit? If we were to go over to Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 21, we see this exact passage quoted by Peter, the apostle. In Acts chapter 2 is when the church is just beginning and God sends the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and the Holy Spirit invades earth and breathes life and breathes life into the apostles and to the believers that are there. And Peter preaches right after that happens and he quotes this. Folks, we're in the last days. We've been in the last days since Jesus ascended and the Holy Spirit came. It may happen tomorrow. It may happen way, way, way in the future. We don't know. The hope of Christ is that he will come again. But the thing that we must understand is we are in the last days. Peter is speaking into that. We understand that. We need to prepare for that. We need to be ready for that. And notice verse 31. I'll read it to you. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Before what? The great and awesome day of the Lord. It's going to be evident that those who are here and on earth, and there's so many different theories about how that's going to work in that I won't get into right now because your tongue will be hanging as you left, um, as I often do when I read this stuff. But he said it's great. It's awesome. You won't endure before it if you don't know the king. And then in chapter 3, he really gets into the end times. And I just want to pull out two verses there. By the way, I'd encourage you, go back and read and, and, and read and read and read this chapter and this, 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 this book. But notice what he says in verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. One day, God's going to draw all mankind in some form or fashion, and this is not just here, throughout Scripture, to a valley of decision. Somewhere in the Middle East, probably in modern-day Israel, in that area. And God's going to show that he's working and he's made a decision about mankind. So we, we see that here and the reality of it and the fate. And then when you look at verse 18, and on that day, so that happens. But a couple of verses later, and on that day, the mountains will drip. This is for those who follow the Lord, who believe in Christ. The mountains will drip with sweet wine and the hills will flow with milk and all the brooks of Judah will flow with water and a spring will go out from the house of the Lord into the water of the valley of Shittim. Notice that. The promise of God as he speaks to that last day is, I will make a decision against all of humanity, including those who faithfully follow me will know the blessing and joy of walking with me. I want to share with you a couple of verses that, that just enhance this. By the way, you could do, do a, a Google search of the day of the Lord in times. Although I, I tell you this, you know, when I say stuff like that, when I tell you to Google stuff, I get a little nervous. <sighs> because Google's Google. And what's that? There's some weird stuff out there. You need anything you read Make sure the Word of God is next to you. And if it can't be verified, just say, oh, that's interesting. Move along. But there's a ton of verses on this. Let me just throw a couple at you. Zephaniah 14, 1, 14, and 18. The great day of the Lord is near. See that word again, that phrase. Near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of the Lord. It, in it, the warrior cries out bitterly. 
Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's anger, and all the earth will be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he will make a complete end, indeed a horrifying one, of all the inhabitants of the earth. It's pretty ominous. Jesus speaks to this issue. And by the way, the reason that the verses you're, you're seeing, there's, there's many verses. I'm trying to show you the Old Testament again speaks of it. Jesus spoke of it. Paul spoke of it. Peter spoke of it. All the scripture speaks of it. It's consistent. Matthew 25, 31 through 33. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate them one from another, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right, and he will put the, sh- and the goats on his left. Okay? Sheep on his right, goats on his left. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, Paul in speaking says, For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord is coming like a thief in the night. That's why we don't know the day, we don't know the time. 2 Peter three ten, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be discovered. All that we have and know will come to order. One day, God's going to use a time of judgment to set everything in the order which he wants. And all of mankind that's ever existed, Scripture tells us, and that this is one of those areas I tell you, whatever comes out of my mouth, go validate with Scripture. That's why we don't give dates and times and certain things because we don't know. But a day will come when God will set in order the day of the Lord. So let's, let, let's unpack this. The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is biblical truth. The day of the Lord is Christian doctrine. And so we need to decide how we're going to respond. So here's the challenge to you today and to me today on two sides of this. Let's talk about real-time options. Let's talk about today, my life today, how I'm living today. Whether it's now or whether it's sometime in the future, will I recognize that, that my sin causes damage? And that there comes to points in my life that to truly heal, to truly move forward with God in a holy way. I need to acknowledge that and repent of it. God, forgive me. You know, sometimes we may not do that because it can seem so ominous. Oh, I'm admitting to this, or golly, that's so embarrassing. But God can do such a mighty work when we humble ourselves. So I must recognize the damage that my sin has caused in a relationship, in a family, at work, in my community, whatever area. I confess, I repent, and I seek God's forgiveness. But here's what God promises, as we saw in 1 John 1, 9, a new life, new righteousness. So real-time option, will you deal with it? Now, what about future-time option? This is really dealing with the issue of salvation. And do I accept that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for my sins? Will I prepare my life and my heart to meet him one day? Will I recognize that my own sin nature and sin keeps me away from God? And and understanding that, will I admit that I'm a sinner in need of God's forgiveness? Will I repent of that sin and ask Jesus to come into my life and be my Savior who saves me and be my Lord who guides me? And make that confession of him. Now, just because I'm ready to meet God in the future doesn't mean I don't have issues today to clean up. I still have issues today I may need to clean up. But it means I am the right footing with the living God and can walk forward with him. And one day, worship at his feet. That's the gospel. Those are the options. Romans 10, 13, which is really comes off of what we just read in Joel a moment ago. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's God's promise to you and me today. If I'll trust, I'll allow him to work. So what are you going to do? What am I going to do? 
sat in my office this morning before I came in here, and it's like, oh, God, how does this apply to me? It does bad. What about you? So here's the challenge today. Will you open your heart to allowing God to just prod around and maybe show you some things you need to deal with? After the prod, and God may say, we're, we're pretty good. We need, to, we need to live. We need to do things. We need to be humble. But, but there's nothing that's a barrier. He may say that, and that's awesome. Then again, he may say, hey, there's some barriers to fellowship with me, and we need to deal with it. As a follower of Jesus, will you deal with that? As we sing in a moment, we're going to sing the song Waymaker. Okay? By the way, it's not a quiet song. Um, get us going. Get us focused. But here's the deal. God will provide a way. And as you're in your seat, I mean, you can stand, you can kneel, you can pray, whatever you want to do. Come up here and pray. Repent. Your, your issues are your issues. They're not mine. If you want me or Pastor Josh to pray with you, we'd love to. But, but will you face it? If you need to come to faith in Christ today, will you face it? Right where you are. You don't need me, but I'm here to help you. Talk to Jesus and... and Admit that you're a sinner. Repent of your sins. Ask him to be your Savior and Lord. Allow me to talk to you as you leave. See me. If you're virtual church today or if you're, you're not quite ready to come forward but you, you want to work, email us. Send a card to us. You know, Take the communication card that Trish mentioned at the beginning. Fill that out. Put it in the offering box as you leave or put it in my hand. And there may be other things you need to do today. You, to, to show that obedience, you need to... <sighs> You may need to follow in believer's baptism. You need to decide to deal with some discipleship and become a more like Christ. You may want to join with our church family, whatever God's doing. Let God do it. Let God do it. I want you to stand with me. As you stand with me, the team will join me. I'm going to pray over us, and they're just going to lead us in this song. But as they do, will you allow God to work? For all of us that are in the building and all of us that are virtual, God has told us that he wants to drive us to him. He wants us to deal with sin so we can walk with him now and forever. There's the opportunity. Father, we give this time to you. We thank you for your word. It's been serious today. We thank you for it. May you speak to us in Christ's name. Amen.